Wow, thank you, ladies. Um, all I could have hoped for in, in uh, trying to get some high school writings up here. Thank you very much. Uh, so now we begin the open mic portion of our evening, and um, I'll announce the first three and then we'll proceed. First up, we have Isaac Tim, Sarah Anderson, and Diane Hardy. In 2009, I just started school and I was a history major. Um, I love history. I love the stories of people. I think the story, like the real stories are just amazing, better than fiction a lot of times. And um, I was in a folklore class by a really sweet man named Steve Saporin. I Just really lovely. If you could, if, when you go to university and you could take folk, folklore, take it from Steve. He's, he's wonderful. But I had to miss a class with a final because I had to go to a medical appointment. And this medical appointment was for muscular dystrophy. <coughs> I spent nine hours. One of those hours just set up on a, on a stool with about 12 med students talking about my disease and how I was a per perfect example of it. Naked as a jaybird. When people tell you that writing poetry leaves you naked, I know what that means. <laughs> so I come to I come to do my final and I'm these things are really bring me down. And the only room they had open in the English department was the May Swenson room. And I had no idea who May Swenson was. And I liked the English department. I kind of floated around there because I wanted to write. I've always wanted to write, but I was a history major gosh darn it, and I was gonna keep to that. So she put me in, put me in the room and I did this final. And I, after the final, I started looking around and I saw Mae Swenson and I saw her books and I was writing at her desk. I was literally sitting at her desk and I could feel, I don't know what it was, it was just amazing. And I wrote in the bottom of my, my little book, I wrote, I ask a ghost for a word. And the first, I signed up for a creative writing class from Michael Souter and I became an English major. And I had no idea who Mae Swenson is. And a week ago, I finished her collection, and I feel like I know who she is. And that's what's amazing about writing, is you get a connection with the dead, and you get to feel they're living, not just the history of them, but who they were. A woman who was completely different from me. And we get to share this in, in this room. And every time you pick up poetry or your favorite writer, you get to share this world. And this is a poem I wrote called Touching Blue um, from uh, Star Colebrook's prompt. Touching Blue. The blue Ford cocks up its front wheel, a paw aimed to climb the clouds. Then it comes down with a thump. The road redraws the sky once again flat against the earth as we bump up the jeep track into the mountains towards the high meadows of Indian Farm. The V8 growls to the axles as smoke of burning rubber comes into the bed, granite burning like basalt. The girl cousins scream, the truck looks to tip, fall down the mountain, but my father has the will. Under his hands, it climbs shore. I'm pushed deep into backpacks, fill boxes of mac and cheese against my face, 
thin candy bars, which I still, stuffing pilfered chocolate into my cheeks, a painted squirrel, chin dripping guilt. It is the beginning. When we reach the cabin at Road End, we will continue the climb to Sky on foot. that I wrote last night, so the first one is called Storm. The sky glowed with anticipation for the coming storm. It ends life and creates a new, a horror, a savior. Okay, and the second one is called Lost. Invisible hands clench my mind, unable to recognize these walls, searching for remembrance and coming up short. No different is this wall from the next and the next. All my hunts for hope have failed. I am lost. This is a poem, <clears throat> Bird Song. An injured robin and a weary blue jay, jaded by brutal winters and the ravages of time, lose their song. One spring day, they happen upon each other, cling through the undergrowth of desperation and doubt, then make a new song, a duet that strolls down a different path, one that winds through love's way, sure-footed. It lies along a road, a road less traveled. Okay, next up we have Ronald, then Karen, and then Bill. My roommates fight, and I am 14 again, lying in bed as shouts and curses hit me through cardboard thin walls. My roommates fight, and I am 14 again, lying in bed as the constrictive stuff seizes. And this one's called On a Visit to Crystal Hot Springs. Mineral waters soak out our impurities. Our skin is smoothed under their touch. Splashing, playing as if I am young again. Being in a pool gives me the excuse to be a child again. Later, I suck on ice cubes and Slurpees, 
to soothe the inside of my mouth where the waters burned it, so they can heal and wound. Thank you. Okay, there's a little bit of a backstory with this. Um, way back, long time ago, ancient history, um, my grandfather used to have a greenhouse up there where the hyper building is. And, you know, so the family knew May Swenson. And my dad was in the military, so we moved around. Now, poetry, well, I'm the kind of guy that has had nuns run away when I've asked them for directions. <laughs> Blind ladies have whacked me with a cane. So if you see a brunette heading this way, let me, let me know, because I can't see well. Um, now, May Swenson was an acquaintance. I, like I said, I moved around, and it's, it's kind of interesting. So this is called Meetings with Me, Book Signing, New York. Why the hell am I here? Get me out of this suit. Boring, I want to go home. Maybe if. No, Dad said he would kill me, but Grandma's got my back. Ah, uh, nah. Sign book, hey, this is pretty cool. Conversations of Logan, Cache Valley, a place I've never seen, a place made called home. At six months old, I went to live in Libya. I came back from Libya to visit my dad's grandparents in New York City, and May was reading her poetry, and I went. Greenhouse, Hiro. Grandma, Miss Swenson is here. Bill, would you help her? Sure. But she will just suggest I read things I don't want to read. <laughs> Bill, has anything she suggested ever hurt you? Grandma, it's poetry. Not always. You liked her last suggestion. Yes, but it wasn't poetry. Nothing wrong with poetry, Bill. I'd rather read encyclopedias. <laughs> Help Miss Swenson and have her suggest a reading list. Grandma, Bill, I'll have your father, father get the books. Damn. Grandma, I'd rather go fishing. I know, said Grandma. Junior high. Bill, what are you doing? May, if you pinch off these, if you pinch these off, you'll get more blooms. Bill, how's the pro poetry doing? Ah, uh, about the same, which is, may inquire, you know, only when I have to for school. If you have any, any suggestions for literature, I'll read them though. Royal Bakery, college. 1978. Bill, how is school? May, it sucks. Why, might I inquire? English class. I have to write poetry. May, she laughs. May, can I buy you a cup of coffee or something? No, I have some. Well, I have to go. Oh, May, on the way home, I'll get that tree branch in your yard. Bill, write what you speak. See, speak from your heart. What are you going to do tonight, Bill? Well, May, it's a full moon. And the browns are spawning. Okay, and our final three readers will be Angela, Marianne, and Tina.
this is a poem I wrote for the poetry workshop that um, has been going on with the Community Writing Center, and it's titled Swinging Rope, and it's based off an event in my life, and so um, here it is. <coughs> Branches groaned as weight and motion pushed the fledgling forward, a takeoff planned in private. Her tiny fingers, long and slim, clutched coarse rope, a lifeline really. She greeted the water's current below her dangling feet and reached out her hand, lingering in a moment of suspension before swaying back to the bank. Like a pendulum, back and forth, she swung out over the river, never halting flight, birds soared above, calling her name. And each time she heard it, a savory pride, daring and fearlessness filled her. The newness began to fade, a longing to be grounded sank in, yet how to stop the swinging motion once it starts? Carefully, fingers slid down the rope to a safer landing, but the skin rubbed raw, burning the flesh on the hands fit for a vulture's feast. Little bird, you flew too soon. And we just worked off it yesterday, so anyone in the group, I have not made my changes yet. I'm sorry, that doesn't mean that I was ignoring them or I don't think your ideas are good. Um, and just um, as an announcement, we will be holding a second poetry workshop in June. So we won't be meeting next week, but we'll be meeting the 10th, the 17th, the 17th and the 24th. And that will be again taught by our own Tina Sutton, who will react to me. So this is my poem. It's Cartography. The map I carry in my head is wrong. Roads and rivers etched on neurons, courses charted in crayon smudge, before I learned the laws of maps. I etched roads and rivers on neurons, before I knew of spheres and poles. Ignorant of the laws of maps, south my point of orientation. Before they knew its spherical dimensions, cartographers laid the globe on its side, the orient, the point of orientation, and they found their way, somehow. Cartographers laid the globe on its side, inked their own mistaken legends. Somehow, they found their way without knowing as the true direction. Still a child, I inked mistaken legends, charted courses in crayon smudge, refused north as the true direction, but they say the map I carry in my head is wrong. Still, I find my way, somehow. Hello, I'm Tina, um, and I'm proud of all of our workshoppers that got up here. It's so awesome to see. And we've been working on more of a formal approach to poetry, not that you have to. So I brought some formal poems that I've been working on as well, so I'm not hypocritical telling the students to get up and then I don't do it myself. So this first one is a sonnet, and it's called Manic Bipolar. It's for my husband when he was in the height of mania. I was in Spain. I could do nothing about it, and so we're using the form to really control this very chaotic moment. Manic Bipolar. A small kid came to our home to give me a dirty dog-haired navy blue beret. You answered the door alone, too busy, I was gone to Spain, and shooed the kid away. But seeing the beret and what you thought it meant, set the trigger in your purple manic mind, silver bullet casing hot with the maker stamp and sticker, her subtle design left on our front steps. Your copper wire thoughts began to scorch and weep as sun and moon and every star swapped your mathematic head and played for keeps. And when I returned, I found you under the Quaker's mind gone, speaking to thunder. This next one is a puzzle. It's an Arabic form and it has a very particular, um, it's called a refrain. And it's a repeated phrase with also, it has um, a rhyme scheme and it'll have a formal address um, at the end. So it's a little formal, you'll see that in it. It's called After You. After You. 
Invisible sister, and to your annoyance, I have followed and crawled after you. I have traveled back to this memory to wallow and sprawl after you. As the 11-year-old girl chasing brother, I straddled the high fence where you built a square fort from stolen lumber, built its roof and walls after you broke apart your ramp, fixing nails to planks and skeleton boards to upright posts and cross rails. This crucifix you made for our shelter to hide within. At home, the white giant malls after you and me. A separation of houses is sometimes needed and high fences make for better neighbors. Limits bring value, but invisible sisters being both vapor and sponge absorb all. After you died, I must go back to this place, this fence, that mid 90s summer when you invited in your friends to see your architecture. I cannot unglue the words your friends use to call after you. Faggot, they cried, silent, blind, tongue kept between. I cannot find my way off this fence, dear brother. Sister knows this is damnation, complacent stagnation. I am stuck, stalled after you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Joseph. <laughs>